everyone at home, my name is Elia. Welcome to BGCSE Biology lesson, Cell Biology Part 3. So today we are looking at cell processes. So you find that if you look at the cells of living things, time and again we have materials being transported into the cells, we have materials being transported out of the cells. So today we are going to look at the processes which are responsible for the transport of different materials into the cells and out of the cells. So when you look here, the first process here is diffusion. So when you are talking about diffusion, this is the movement of particles from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration until they are evenly distributed. And then if you look at the illustration here, you can see particles being concentrated here and then they are moving to other parts where they are at a low concentration until they are being distributed. Like if you look at these arrows, the other one will go up there, the other one goes down. This shows the, the even distribution of particles. So now let's look at factors affecting this diffusion. The first factor will be the temperature. We know that at high temperatures, these molecules, they gain kinetic energy. And once they gain kinetic energy, they start to move to different parts. And then when the temperature is low, it means the diffusion rate is going to be low because now these molecules, their kinetic energy is also low, hence a low movement. And then the second factor is the particle size. You find that large particles, they will take a long time to move from this area to that area. But then if you look at those particles which are small in size, they will move very fast from this area to that area because it is easier to carry a light molecule compared to a large molecule. So that's all about diffusion. Let's move to the other form of transport. So the second one is what we call passive transport. So when you're talking about passive transport, this is where now molecules, they move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration down their concentration gradient. For example, if you look at these molecules here, they are at a high concentration in this region, and then they will cross this membrane. They will cross this membrane and then they will move inside where their concentration is low. So the fact that they are moving from where they are high to where they are low, we're saying they move down their concentration gradient. And remember, they are crossing this membrane. For example, think about a carbon dioxide crossing those walls of the alveoli. So that's another example of passive transport in the human body, that carbon dioxide will move where it is at a high concentration, cross the walls of the alveoli then to where it is at a low concentration. Then the third form of transport is what we call active transport. So if you look at these two processes, I said molecules, they move from where they are high to where they are low. But when we come to active transport, now we are going to have a different case. This time around, we are going to have molecules moving from where they are at a low concentration to where they are at a high concentration against their concentration gradient. And one thing that you should take note of this process that it is an energy demanding process. The reason being that if you look at the illustration here, these molecules, they are moving from where they are at a high concentration against the concentration gradient. And then even this ones, they are moving into this cell against their concentration gradient. So there are some structures in this cell. So these are called the membrane proteins. So these membrane proteins, they are responsible for taking this molecule and then push it into the cell or take this molecule outside the cell and then push it also into the cell. So the reason why it is it's energy demand is because these proteins, they have to keep on contracting and relaxing so that they can push this molecule into the cell. Let's take an example. If you look at potassium and sodium, Potassium always, it has to be high inside the cell and low outside the cell. But we find that because of those concentrations, we are going to have this potassium leaking outside the cell. But still, the concentration will be high inside and low outside. So we are going to have these proteins pushing back that potassium into the cell where it originates, right? And then if you look at sodium, sodium has to be high outside the cell and low inside the cell. And because of those concentrations, we are going to have this sodium leaking into the cell. So we are going to have this, this membrane proteins again, pushing that sodium out of the cell, going out this time around. It's supposed to be like this. It's going to be pushed out of the cell going out. So it will be against the concentration gradient because if sodium is high here 
and low here the expectation is that it should move from high to low but in this case it goes back to where it belongs which is outside the cells so this way now the energy demanding process comes in because now these proteins in order for them to push these molecules against their concentration they need energy for that contraction that I talked about okay so the last cell processes that we are going to talk about is osmosis Osmosis is the movement of water molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration across a selectively or partially permeable membrane. Movement of water molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration across a partially or selectively permeable membrane. So you find that osmosis has a different uh, or a number of effects on our plant and animal cells. So if you look here, this is a, a general animal cell in the normal environment. That's how it appears. And then if you look here, this is how a plant cell will appear in a normal environment. Now, if you are going to expose these cells to different environments now, for example, in a solution with a high concentration or a solution with a low concentration, because of osmosis, at the end of the day, these cells are going to look different as you can see here. So let's start with animal cells exposed to a high concentrated solution. So, if you take this cell, right, and then you put it in a high concentrated solution, it means this cell has a high water potential compared to this solution. And then as a result, we are going to have this cell losing water to the solution through the process of osmosis. And now because the cell is losing water, what happens? The pressure inside the cell, it reduces and a reduction in pressure will result in this state. Look at the appearance of the cell here. So it is shapeless and then the volume has also reduced. So we say this cell is shrinked. So when an animal cell is losing water to a solution, it is going to appear like this or it is going to shrink, right? Because now the water is going to the solution. And then if you take a plant cell and then you place it again in a highly concentrated solution, it means now again this cell, it has a high water potential and then the solution has a low water potential. And then as a result, water moves out of this cell into the solution. And then this is how the cell will appear like. So if you look at those two membranes, here they are close to one another. But then here, the other membrane is sort of detaching from the cell wall. And then we say when a cell like this, it is plasmolized. Because now it has lost the water. And then because of the loss of water also, the volume reduces and then even the pressure inside the cell, it reduces. Now that's when we are going to end up with a cell appearing like this. Now let's look what happens when you take the same cells and then we put them in a different solution. Now this cell it is low concentrated. So if you compare a cell, a normal cell, to a low concentrated solution, this cell has a low water potential and then this cell because it is low concentrated, it means now it has a high water potential. Remember, water molecules move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So they are going to move from the solution where their concentration is high, and then they will move into the cell, as you can see here. And then as they move into the cell, they are going to raise that pressure against the cell membrane of the cell. And then finally, this cell is going to burst, as you can see here. And then we call this bursting. So when an animal cell burst, all the internal contents, they escape, as you can see these arrows, the internal contents, they just go away and then the cell will die. The reason why these cells they are bursting is because they only have a cell membrane, they don't have another membrane which can support the pressure from the water. But then look at the, our plant cells. We take a plant cell, you put it in a low concentrated solution. We are going to have water molecules again moving from this solution into the plant cell. As you can see this arrow here, water is moving into the cell. And then once water gets into this cell, it is going to raise the tagger pressure inside the cell and then even the volume is going to increase. And then if you compare this cell with this one, you can see that this one has increased the volume and then even the pressure has increased. So we say this cell is turgid. So take note, if an animal loses water, 
it becomes shrinked. If a plant loses water, it becomes plasmalized. If a plant gains water, it, I mean an animal cell gains water, it is going to burst. And then if a plant gains water, it becomes turgid. The reason why we don't see the plant cells bursting is because they have this membrane, the cell wall. And because of this cell wall, it means now they can resist the pressure that is caused by the trigger pressure inside the cell. But then they will just remain turgid. And then the last question is for application. You can be given a beaker like this, and then we have a partially permeable membrane. And then we have two solutions of different levels, as you can see here. Let's say maybe we have just water the side. And then this side we have 50% glucose. So if you compare these two, this one has a high concentration of water compared to this one. And then as a result, we are going to have water molecules moving from this side, coming this side. Now the question is, if we have water molecules moving from this side, to this side, what is going to happen to these volumes after some time? So this is what we are going to have. We are going to have this volume of water going down because now water is moving from this side across the partially permeable membrane to the glucose solution. So we'll end up with our level of water somewhere there. And then if you look at our 50% glucose solution, it means now it is gaining water from this side. So it means this level is going to increase. So we'll end up with our glucose solution up to here. So I hope you can see those two differences. So osmosis can also be addressed through this kind of application questions. That's all I had for you today.